Well, welcome back, everybody. Just as we are getting settled, I just want to uh, uh, welcome someone who's joined us, Dr. Joe Kersner, who's there. Dr. Kersner, would you just uh, raise your hand? Dr. Kersner, who uh, is obviously well known to many of you, uh, uh, is a professor of medicine, uh, I would think, but I'm not sure, emeritus. And uh, he is one of Mark's uh, main teachers in terms of the art of clinical medicine, which is what Mark has, uh, has told me. So all those stories we've heard over the last day or two about, uh, about, um, about Mark's uh, exploits, including at 20,000 feet in the airplane, which was a great way to start, and all the uh, experiences you heard from Mark's patients who were at dinner last night, for those of you who had a chance to hear from them, uh, are attributable not only to Mark, not only to the other people we've heard from, like Al Tarlov, uh, but very, very significantly to Dr. Kersner. So welcome to you, and thank you for joining us. This uh, afternoon session, which I'm very pleased to uh, uh, host, um, is called The Three Pillars of Academic Medicine, Research, Teaching, and Patient Care. And uh, the first uh, focus panel session is on clinical ethics research and research ethics consultation. It's scheduled to go on for an hour and a quarter. We're going to try and make it a little bit less than an hour and a quarter to make the uh, medical education session slightly longer. So would love to end this sometime between 2.30, 2.45 and switch into the uh, other one. I'm going to be a bit ruthless with the time this afternoon because the one thing we want to do is make sure Mark starts talking at 5. As you know, Mark's scheduled to talk for 15 minutes. Um, that uh, may or may not happen, but if he starts after 5 o'clock, we'll be here uh, uh, a long time. And so we want to make sure that Mark starts right at 5 o'clock. I also want to ask, I noticed that in the morning session, John, you had a panelist there, and he was often sitting in this chair, and um, he had a lot of things to say. He wasn't on the program. Um, does anyone know who that was? I asked uh, John Lantos that question. He said it was Zelig. But uh, we'll, see if it's, uh, we'll, we'll see if it's the same guy that's going to sh uh, show up at 5 for his, uh, for his final remarks. So this session is called Clinical Ethics Research and Research Ethics Consultation. And what I'd like to do is introduce the three speakers, ask them then to come and give their talk sequentially. They'll take a maximum of 15 minutes each. So we should have at least 15 minutes, maybe a little bit more time for, uh, for discussion. The three speakers are uh, Carol Stocking, Rick Kodish, and Chris Dougherty. Uh, Carol Stocking, we already know who Carol Stocking is, as uh, she's the person to whom Mark is the number one collaborator on, uh, on, on, on her list. Uh, in her life, Mark is a little bit like um, the number one fan on, uh, on Hannah Montana, for those of you who have uh, who've, uh, watched that. She spent two decades, actually, at the National Opinion Research Center before joining Mark at the McLean Center, where she served as the director of research. She has a PhD from the University of Chicago, uh, she, as you know, is Mark's number one co-author, and uh, uh, maybe at least as significantly, I think she's very much facilitated the empirical research career of very many, maybe every fellow uh, that passed through, uh, passed through the center. I'd like to introduce all three people on the panel, and then I'll ask Carol to come up and start. The, the second speaker is going to be Rick Kodish, um, who's the F.J. O'Neill Professor and Chairman of the Department of Bioethics at the Cleveland Clinic Foundation and a professor of pediatrics at the Lerner College of Medicine of Case Western. After fellowships here at the University of Chicago in pediatric oncology and in, uh, at the McLean Center, he joined uh, the staff of the Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital, where he's founding director of the Rainbow Center for Pediatric Ethics. And I think of Rick a bit as the type of person that Jack Wenberg was talking about yesterday, uh, a correlate of the shared decision making, utilities, understanding, a little bit of empirical research uh, side of the equation with some others uh, who are here. Chris Doherty is Associate Professor of Medicine in the Section of Hematology Oncology here at the University of Chicago. Uh, he received his MD from Indiana University in 89. He completed his residency there in internal medicine. In 92, he came to the University of Chicago as a fellow in Hemonc and also in the McLean Center, joined the faculty here in 96, and uh, subsequently has um, uh, risen uh, to become the chair of the uh, uh, Institutional Review Board in the Biological Sciences Division 
at the University of Chicago, and since 2005 has been the co-director of the program in cancer and the social sciences in the Cancer Research Center at the University of Chicago. So there's the three introductions. Our focus is on clinical ethics research and research ethics consultation. Our first speaker is uh, Carol Stocking. Uh, our first speaker is uh, Carol Stocking. Am I right about that? Yes, Carol, please, thank you, and welcome onto the show today. Um, thank you for all three introductions. I richly deserved all three. <laughs> and Mark, is, is this working? Okay. Mark, thank you, and to the McLean family. Uh, the title of my talk is Informal Remarks about the first decade ish of the center. I will start with full disclosure. I hate to speak at meetings. I have vowed several times never to agree to do it again. But here I am, this time bolstered by a script, which I plan to read word for word. <laughs> I will maintain adequate gravitas. I will not make associational leaps. I will not be reminded of anecdotes. I will just plow on. <laughs> But don't worry, I won't plow on too long. Peter has sternly warned me. I'll focus my comments on what I see as Mark's overall contribution to empirical research in clinical medical ethics. I've used only two sources. I'm a researcher. Mark's CV, which increases all but, almost by the minute, and my memory, which decreases at about the same rate. <laughs> Oh yes, and one more source, I called Human Resources to find out when I started to work here. <laughs> April 22nd, 1985, thus possibly fixing the year in which the center began. At least I got the impression from Mark that the center had just started when he recruited me to be the director of research. No, make that director of research programs, make no small plans. <laughs> of a center which was not exactly extant. As far as I could tell when I arrived, the center was an energy field emanating from Mark. <laughs> that energy field is still the center of the center. There was more, some of which we heard about yesterday. There was an established interdisciplinary a seminar. Uh, and Mark was in conversation with the neurologist about the troubling ethical issues that that physician and his colleagues were facing about offering the then newly available for this purpose option of mechanical ventilation to ALS patients who were no longer able to breathe on their own. Mark wanted to talk to the patients, still in early, age, early stages of the disease, about their wishes for care at the end, end of their lives. And he was in another conversation with orthopedic surgeons and an, an infectious disease doctor about the attitudes of surgeons who were then being asked to operate on patients infected with the then always fatal HTLV3, which was renamed HIV as the project went on. So before you, before all of the research done by all of the fellows and Mark's center faculty colleagues, Mark was out there ginning up empirical projects related to clinical ethics, and the projects were based on real issues clinicians faced in the care of patients. I mentioned that before the center, Mark had already generated an inter inter interdisciplinary seminar, and he was doing quantitative research with neurologists, orthopedic surgeons, and an infectious disease doctor. I'm not sure what to call it, maybe intellectual networking. It's a somewhat different take on the term interdisciplinary. I'm not sure what the best term for it is, but Mark is a master at it, and that mastery has enriched the field. My job description, which of course really didn't exist in 1985, was to help Mark and his fellows, and his colleagues, develop and implement empirical projects related to clinical medical ethics. And I was supposed to do as much or as little as when ne needed to be done. My role on various projects could be described as colleagueship or leadership or followership. I know that's not really a word. Whatever was useful on a given project. Mark's notion was to provide a well-trained person, but one who was assigned to move the agendas of other people forward. Mark knew that data-based articles were one-way discussions about ethics could be published in medical journals 
and that was the readership he wanted to reach. So he supported me, not only intellectually, but financially. It seemed perfectly reasonable to me. How was I to know that there was no one else in the whole medical center with a role like mine? I could immerse myself in the project of others and just sort of do whatever needed to be done. It was a lot of fun for me, very stimulating. I did teach a course in research methods, and for perhaps the first decade, fellows and I worked together closely on projects. It provided very practical experience for them. We did interviews, we coded responses, we entered data. Together, some people in this room and I figured out how to use SAS, which was famously undocumented at that time. We analyzed data and the fellows wrote papers with Mark's assistance and enthusiastic support. Back to April 1985, there weren't any fellows, but I knew I was expected to work with fellows. <laughs> and then in July, John the Puma arrived. And then fellows arrived every July, every July thereafter. In the first, perhaps, decade, of, the fellowship was full time, or at least four days a week, so that it was feasible a stretch but feasible for a fellow to complete the two quantitative papers during the year that were suggested in Mark's fellowship acceptance letter. I think Susan Toll said 10. But, uh, Mark had published widely in both medical and other journals before quantitative studies began to appear in his bibliography. Then on page 16 of Mark's CV, publications of quantitative studies with fellows as first authors begin to appear and they continued to be sprinkled through Mark's list of publications thereafter, most often in the early period. Fellows brought their own interests and clinical experience to the center. They were stimulated here by the faculty, their colleagues, and the discussions in seminars and conferences at the center. They designed and implemented extremely varied quantitative research projects during this time. And on their way to publication, fellows presented posters and papers at meeting, developing their own networks, and incidentally, publicizing the center. The fellows, marketing maybe, I don't know. The fellows, as first authors, published their quantitative work with Mark at the center in JAMA, Archives, JGIM, Mayo Clinic's Proceedings, New England Journal, American Journal of Medicine, Lancet, which I think of as kind of general medical journals, and in Public Health Reports, Academic Medicine, Journal of Clinical Oncology, Neurology, Nephrology, Annals of Emergency Medicine, CHEST, the American Journal of Kidney Disease, Critical Care Medicine, Head and Neck. I read the list to demonstrate how successful Mark's fellows were in publishing ethics articles based on empirical studies the fellows did during their terms at the center in both general and specialty medical journals. One cannot be sure how many phys physicians who subscribed to those journals chose to read these articles, but certainly some of them did. During this period, only one quantitative article a fellow wrote with Mark was published in an ethics journal. And included with the first author fellow and Mark as co-authors of the publications I just mentioned were many other center fellows, 20 faculty members from other sections and departments, often from the specialty mentioned in the journal title. There were also fellows and nurses from outside of the center and medical students among the co-authors. And of course, those and subsequent center fellows have gone on to publish empirical studies about after their fellowship ended. Some have studied empirical methods. Others have relied on statistical expertise of colleagues. Some may not have involved themselves in empirical research again, but contribute to, continue to contribute essays, commentaries, books to the literature. Some now have very long bibliographies, and of course, some are publishing with their own students and fellows. But all of this was inspired and nourished in the first generation by Mark. So in retrospect, Mark always considered empirical research to be a facet of clinical medical ethics. He contributed his energy and his charismatic spark to train by now more than 200 fellows. They and he, with others, have written dozens of articles based on empirical research and have encouraged others to do so. And as for me, I've had the pleasure of thinking hard about diverse problems, conjuring ways of studying some of them, and working very closely with many of you. We've gone together to the most interesting places. Mark and colleagues, thank you.
Carol, let me just take this occasion to say that I think everyone in this room knows that uh, uh, the, the movement that Mark started, the field that I think uh, Mark helped create, the experience of all these uh, fellows would have been uh, very different and not, uh, not to the good without, uh, without what you've done. And I think now would be a good time for us all to... <laughs> So thank you very much, uh, Carol. Uh, Rick, could I ask you to come and, uh, and present? We're looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much. Dr. Siegel, good afternoon. I think that my remarks um, will be brief and will hopefully serve as a little bit of a bridge between Carol's talk and, and Chris's talk. Um, Carol spoke to us about um, research in medical ethics. Um, another way to frame this session is uh, research about research ethics, um, specifically the ethical issues that happen when human beings become uh, research subjects. And uh, I think for the um, field, it's a really important dichotomy. And, and one of the amazing thing about Mark's uh, success is that although the term clinical ethics, I think most people um, hear as relating to um, ethics in medical care, a lot of the seeds of um, how we currently think about research ethics um, were also sown uh, in those early years. And I know Chris will pick up on that theme. Um, I'm gonna do a two-part talk here. The, the first um, is gonna use some slides and then I'll close with some personal reflections. Um, and uh, I've entitled this uh, when Mark picked up the phone. What you see here is um, the first paper that appears on my CV. It's called Ethical Considerations in Randomized Clinical Trials. And this paper, which was published in Cancer in um, 1990, has some uh, important ideas that I think are still very relevant to randomized clinical trials. They pick up on some of the ideas related to the uh, autonomy, beneficence, tension that we spoke about um, earlier today and, and yesterday afternoon. Um, one of the key paragraphs um, here says, uh, the RCT arose in an era when patient autonomy was less widely respected or encouraged than it is today, and that today was 1990, uh, reflecting a paternalistic tradition which tolerates some coercion of patients, either for the good of society or, more importantly, for the patient's own good. Today, medical paternalism is less acceptable than it was in the past. As a result, a more limited role for the randomized clinical trial may be compatible with both ethical and scientific needs and may improve support for clinical research by both patients and physicians. This was long before people talked about community-based participatory research. There were no CTSAs going on. This was really very, very, very prescient, I think. And remember that this is published in a journal called Cancer, um, uh, the Journal of the American Cancer Society. And the suggestion here in this paragraph is um, that one should maybe consider a more limited role for randomized clinical trials, um, a threat to the dogma of, uh, of clinical research. Um, and then the last um, piece I'm going to read of the, about this um, goes as follows. It says, finally, this is the section that deals with patient autonomy. It says, patient autonomy in an RCT is completely safeguarded only if the patient is free to choose without agreeing to participate in the RCT. Uh, any therapy which they might have received by participating in the RCT and is equally free to choose the randomization alternative. That's a, that's a really interesting thing. You have arm A and arm B. Arm A is the best current um, uh, proven uh, treatment. Arm B is the experimental arm. The suggestion here is that patients uh, who are being considered for a randomized trial should be free to choose arm B if they want, right? Of course, a patient may abnegate the freedom to make specific treatment choices by a prior voluntary and uncoerced consent at the time of enrollment in the RCT. 
If a patient may obtain one treatment only through randomization, however, then enrollment in an RCT may usurp patient preference and compromise autonomy. So these were, I think, really interesting ideas um, in, back in 1990. And in one way, the mark of a good ethics paper is this. Um, if you look at the editor's note. The views expressed in this paper are those of its authors and do not necessarily reflect the views of the editors and reviewers of cancer. I didn't quite know what to make of this at the time, but I now view this as a badge of honor. Um, here's another view of this, and, and, and I think this also says something very special about Mark and his style. You can't see it here, it's in the fine print, so I, I'll blow it up for you. This was presented at the ACS workshop on clinical trials, the Ritz-Carlton in Naples, Florida, September 14th and 15th, 1989. I'm sure Mark has fond memories of uh, delivering this paper while I was here freezing in Chicago. <laughs> so a potential t-shirt slogan about this. My mentor went to the Ritz-Carlton in Florida and all he brought me back was this opportunity for my first peer-reviewed publication. Um, and uh, I think probably many of us ha have had that. Even this morning, Mark said, someone send me some notes about that, right? This is part of the style and what, what Richard Epstein said this morning. Asking you for a favor, it's really a, a favor to you. You just don't realize it at the time. So I, I think it's important for each of us to have uh, what I like to call an attitude of gratitude to, to Mark and say, say thank you for this. Um, I also want to get back to research ethics. Um, I, I had um, a lot of other research projects um, that I was interested in as a fellow, um, and I'll, I'll speak about one of them in a minute. But later on, we did um, uh, continued work on randomization, and I hadn't really realized it until I was preparing for, for this talk, but the conceptual platform for the work that we, we did um, toward the end of the 90s and early 2000, which was published in this uh, JAMA paper is, is also related to randomization. Um, the observation that when uh, kids are diagnosed with leukemia, they are almost always recruited to become participants in randomized clinical trials. And uh, this was uh, a piece of empirical work we did that linked very closely to the conceptual questions that were raised in the uh, cancer paper that I showed you before. So what I'm trying to do here is, is um, show a thread of continuity to the conceptual work in research ethics that, that came out of the, the early days of, uh, of Mark's, uh, Mark's uh, work. And um, I know we'll talk on the panel about the ethical issues in phase one cancer trials in um, uh, in human subjects. Chris will talk more about that. We're doing an empirical study now, and we're audio taping the consent discussions in those, uh, those trials. So this, um, I think, need to continue to do empirical work in, in bioethics is still very important and a, a real tribute to Mark. Okay, I'm gonna now move to the little bit more personal remarks and then turn it over to, to Chris. So if I was a clever and creative person, I would say it was 20 years ago today that Mark Siegler taught the band to play. But uh, I wasn't able to make up a song, so it was 20 years ago that I first encountered Mark Siegler. I was a senior resident at Children's Memorial in Lincoln Park, and I came down to the South Side to meet with the director of what was then a fledgling ethics fellowship program. I was a newlywed, and my wife Peroff needed to spend one more year in Chicago to finish her degree. I was um, looking for a one-year gig. I was planning to do pediatric hemonc at Johns Hopkins, and um, all that changed when Mark picked up the phone. I'd always been more interested in ethics and humanities than in molecular hematology and oncogenesis, in some ways the, uh, the sort of wounded uh, medical student that was described yesterday too. Um, I had a strong medical school curriculum called Human Values in Medicine. During my senior year in medical school, I spent a month with Norm Faust up in Madison. These sort of things had instilled an interest in me to, to make me think a year of ethics training uh, after residency would be fun, if not worthwhile professionally. Um, I'd been given advice by the chair of pediatrics at Northwestern, where I was a resident, that a uh, laboratory research program was a sine qua non for career success, and that ethics could be nothing more than a sideline or even worse, a potential distraction. <laughs> right? It's true. I was warned, but Mark was persuasive. With me sitting in front of him, Mark behind his desk, did he offer me a cigar? No. He picked up the phone and he called Len Johnson, who was the head of pediatric hemonc here at U of C at the time, and he said, Len, I got this guy Kodish here. 
He's finishing his residency in June. I think we should offer him a four-year combined ethics, pediatric hematology, oncology training program. It would be the first of its kind in the country. <laughs> Mark did not obtain my informed consent to pick up the phone. Mark picked up the phone. His powers of persuasion were effective with Dr. Johnson and with me. Um, having a, a glass of whiskey with John Lantos uh, later that night, I think, sealed the deal. And before I knew what had happened, my life had changed. One year turned into four years. My career trajectory was realigned. Um, with the innocence and naivete of youth, I was probably oblivious to the risk I was taking with my future. Later in my training, a different mentor from the field of oncology said to me, you ethicists, you're always on the side of the tumor. <laughs> it's true. I know, I know that he was only joking, but, but I also appreciate that deep within most humor is a kernel of truth. His joke may reflect the perception of many clinicians, not just oncologists. In the war against disease, ethics consultants, maybe bioethicists more largely, can be viewed as having uh, a complicity with the enemy. So casting my lot with this group was in some sense a leap of faith, but one that in retrospect I'm glad to have leapt. Um, I won't go through the cast of characters that were here at the uh, center at the time. They've been mentioned before. Um, it, was, it was really a terrific group. We were um, going through the first Gulf War at the time. We were figuring out how email worked with something called BitNet. Um, it was um, a, a time when ideas were floating that would go on to really shape our careers. Uh, we had lunch at the Div School coffee shop where God drinks coffee. You know, it, it sort of says it all. So after four years on the, oh, one, one more story. The, 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 the paper that, that was also important during my fellowship was bone marrow transplant for sickle cell disease, a study of parents' decisions. When we got the letter uh, from the New England Journal um, saying we cannot accept your manuscript, I went to Mark Despondent, and he says, Kodish, it's an acceptance letter, look at it. <laughs> so, I, and, and that's something that I've done many times subsequently, and I'm sure many of you have done with your trainees as well. How do you read a rejection letter? Well, in the, in the Sieglerian vein, a rejection letter means this is accepted, you just have to revise. Um, <laughs> after four years on the south side of Chicago, and then 11 years combining the care of uh, children with cancer and a, a research <laughs> academic career in ethics, I made another leap uh, uh, four years ago to become chair of a department of bioethics at the Cleveland Clinic. The course that Mark had set in motion by picking up the phone uh, seemed to have inevitably led to a commitment that resulted in uh, my current identity as a recovering pediatric oncologist. Uh, in building a faculty group with now nine members uh, in the department, I've continued to rely on Mark for advice. We do 250 consults a year. Um, we've established an ethics fellowship with Mark uh, on the advisory board, collaborating with Case and University Hospitals, Metro, and the VA. In many ways, the program that we have now takes its inspiration from the successful training of so many bioethics leaders that I believe to be Mark's signature accomplishment. Mark has continued to be a wise and valued advisor to me as I've navigated some of the political complexities in the past four years, and I attribute our continued success to, to his good counsel. So I'm gonna end with, uh, with what I consider to be the two M's to describe uh, Mark Siegler. Um, the first is that Mark is a mensch, and that has not been, uh, been said before, but I think it's very important uh, to say that Mark is a real mensch. The second is that um, one has many mentors in, in a career. Um, for me, Mark Siegler has been a, a mentor with a capital M. May he have many more years of success, satisfaction, and good health. Thank you, Rick. That was uh, really nice. And um, uh, so one way to think about the last 25 years is Mark spent 25 years rejecting rejection letters. But he's changed a lot, actually, because I looked over now, and I always remember him writing notes on a large legal-sized yellow pad, and he's now uh, writing notes on a letter-sized yellow pad. So there's been a lot of change over the years. <laughs> Chris, would you uh, give us your talk? Thank you very much. Good afternoon. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. I'm supposed to talk about these uh, two papers. But I think I have a bit of an impossible task, because uh, I think everybody who's gotten a chance to come up here to to, to, to do these presentations um, is obligated to talk about the papers that they're supposed to present, but feels enormous desire to talk about Mark. 
Um, so I, have, I normally would never have ambivalence about presenting data that I've helped create, but I have real ambivalence about creating that data, particularly in the, presenting that data, particularly in the time frame. But I'm supposed to talk about these two papers. I probably am gonna pass up some slides um, to try to keep within our time frame, and also because I, I do wanna talk about, uh, about Mark. I suppose I could have titled my talk when Mark put the phone down, because um, I remember being a fellow, a couple of months old, a fellow in 1992, having been in the so-called phase one clinic here at the University of Chicago, and uh, having lots of questions about what was taking place in that clinic in terms of giving experimental drugs to, to terminally ill cancer patients, and so found my way up into uh, the ethics center. And I think it probably was an experience where it was a Friday afternoon, I went in his office, he had the phone in the crook of his neck. It was probably, I don't know, it was probably Tony Fauci on the phone, and he was probably yelling for Karen Rainey to get Art Kaplan on the phone because he was 10 minutes late for a conference call and he had his pen in his hand and he was scribbling in the margins for some report that was due to the Hastings Center last week. But I came in and he put the phone down and the door closed and he then spent the time with me uh, to talk about the things that I was interested in and of course the shared interest that would, would be there and, uh, and I was hooked at that point, and then became an ethics fellow for four years, was two more years a research associate, uh, so six years in, in training to do the things that I thought uh, that I wanted to do, and these are the first two papers that came from all that, that work with Mark and with the center, and certainly with Carol as well. So that's what I'd like to do, to find the issues of interest, what are these papers about and what is their significance? I feel somewhat obligated to review the papers and their data, but I think we'll do that pretty quickly. And then present research about what has come subsequent to these papers at this institution and a bit elsewhere, and discuss the impact of these papers on other research in research ethics and on the researchers themselves. And the overarching theme, of course, is that this is all a result of Mark's mentorship and, and stewardship. So what are the issues at, at stake in these papers, these, first, these initial papers? It's the, it is the study of the ethics of clinical research involving experimental agents and terminally ill cancer patients, giving drugs for the first time to those who are going to die of their disease. And the role of the McLean Center and Mark specifically in creating the environment for this study to become a productive area of research here is, of course, goes without saying, but, but it needs to be understood that that environment created here has spawned other significant amounts of work and environment at other institutions. And so then try to put these papers and their subsequent research in context with the study of research ethics in general as, as Rick did and the impact of this work on other research ethics. So what are the issues? We're talking about those with advanced cancer. That's half a million people a year in the United States. 550,000 people die every year in the United States of advanced cancer. And of course these deaths, you don't drop dead from cancer. It takes months before your death comes. Uh, yet we know, and clinicians know in advance that there's no possibility of cure. But there are months, sometimes even years before death occurs, and so presumably there's ample time for patients to make decisions and informed decisions. What are their options for care? I apologize for any fellow of the last decade who's seen these slides at least once before. Um, they are continued efforts with standard non-experimental chemotherapy or radiation, which really is the standard of care for 85 to 95 percent of the cancer patient population. Certainly we recognize supportive or palliative care as it has evolved over time, has always been an option for cancer patients, sometimes well employed, sometimes seemingly not uh, well employed, and specifically hospice care. And then there's this option of experimental agents as available in clinical trials or phase one trials. This is a schematic that, that only is attempt to represent uh, the, the alternatives. It's not meant to represent a time course of any given patient, because of course patients can do all three of these things before their death occurs. They might even move back and forth between these boxes before their death <laughs> occurs. So this issue about experimental drugs, phase one trials, we all know that these trials, that, that the clinical trial process begins at the phase one, where drugs come out of the lab for the first time, been given to, to, to animals, shown to have some kind of anti-tumor effects, but no knowledge about whether or not they'll work or whether or not they're even safe in humans, and the process begins with the phase one trial. We're going to expose patients, patients exposed to these drugs 
patients who don't have other options for treatment because you wouldn't want to lose an opportunity, obviously, to provide good anti-cancer therapy to patients. And that opportunity could get lost if you were to uh, put them on a clinical trial of an experimental drug when there was otherwise good therapy for them. And that's something that, of course, would not happen. So the, 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 the issues at stake with regard to phase one trials are a result of how phase one trials are conducted, how they're designed, because they are designed to determine safety, not to determine efficacy. Although occasionally efficacy results sometimes get published, there are most phase one trials will get published with no results on anti-cancer efficacy. And the methods by which they're employed is where, where many problems begin because you're taking patients with very advanced disease and sometimes exposing them to nearly, at least traditionally, nearly homeopathic doses, doses where we would not expect anti-cancer efficacy, where we did not, where, where there was not, was not seen anti-cancer efficacy in the laboratory, um, and only minimal toxicity in the animal models, models, but that's where we start. And then as time progresses and new patients come into the trial, new subjects, doses are escalated with the specific intent of producing harm. Um, and I think there's, there's truth in saying specifically that it's both a provocative term, but the goal of a phase one trial is to produce harm. It is to identify toxicities so that you can back away from that dose and, and eventually study its efficacy in the phase two setting. So moving along quickly, what are those issues then? Um, there really is in published trials, and presumably, probably, if you include the unpublished trials, even less possible uh, potential for efficacy in these phase one trials, at least in the cancer setting. And the published rates, both in the early 1990s as they were available from the literature at the time and even subsequently as recently as 2005 in JAMA, the response rates are on the order of about 5%, where you actually can see documented anti-cancer efficacy. If you remove the experience of one or two drugs from the published research, uh, where there might have been a few remissions, the likelihood of remission is essentially non-existent. The median prognoses that have been described for these patients is on the order of six to eight months. So 50% of patients who enroll in phase one trials will be dead within six to eight months. The vast majority, 85% of them, will be dead within a, within a year. So we're, we're talking about participation of uh, patients with advanced terminal incurable illness as human subjects. And one of the underlying things that we've been interested in since the beginning is, do they really understand their prognosis? Because I think there is a gut response about, if anybody really understood their prognosis and really understood what phase one trials were about, who in their right mind would do such a thing? And in fact, the only kind of publications that were available at the time in the early 90s about phase one trials were editorials about the design of these trials, and that specifically said that. What did they say? They specifically said they can only, these trials can only be ethical it can only be ethical if first we agree that there's a need to serve society's interest in drug discovery for new treatments for cancer. But, of course, as in any clinical research, there is this conflict of interest with regard to the goals of the patient who's becoming the subject, the goals of society, and having to use patients as means to an end to serve society's interest in developing new therapies. So that can happen. Patients can voluntarily allow themselves to be used as research subjects, to be used as research as means to an end. That can allow them, these presumably allow these trials to go forward. But it requires more than adequate, if not even ideal, and maybe, un, maybe even unreachable informed consent. And of course the question was at the time, are we getting it? Are these patients really informed? Do they really understand? And really, except for one small study of uh, 10 European cancer patients in the late 80s, there was absolutely no empirical work on research subjects' experiences in the phase one setting. And, I, and I'll just go ahead and say it, and, and someone can correct me if I'm wrong, there was no evidence, there was no data in the literature with regard to any kind of terminally ill cancer patient participating in any kind of research, and perhaps even more broadly, no information about terminal illness and patients with terminal illness participating in any form of research. Carol mentioned the, the, the ALS study, right? It was Woody Moss study? Yeah, right. Um, so, so yes, they're ethical if these things are met. And if, if finally, and this is where, where many people believed it to be the case, they're ethical if subjects participate in phase one trials for altruistic reasons. I know I'm going to die. I know I'm not going to benefit, but somebody else will. Society will. Future patients will as a result of my participation. And for years, many argued that phase one trials were, are unethical, um, are ethical only if subjects participate for altruistic reasons. So that's where it began when Mark put the phone down. 
and allowed me an opportunity to interact with Rick, who was still at the center, with Gene Grichowski, who was a fellow at the time, and of course with Carol. And it then led, right, you do it once, well then you do it again, and you do it again, and you do it again. And that's what we did. And now, I don't know, 12, well, geez, 15, 16 years later, I think actually it's probably nearly a thousand patients have been interviewed who participated in phase one trials. And I don't know, Faye's here some, Faye, where are you? There's Faye. There's virtually one person who has interviewed every single one of these patients, except maybe the first 150. And that's Faye Lubaki, who's here with me today. But we've said, let's look broader, right, than just this issue about, because after you do it for 200 patients and you realize they don't seem particularly well informed, you have to move on and think about the reasons why they don't seem, why they don't seem to be informed. And so we've looked at multiple issues, not just about informed consent, but have gotten very interested in trying to examine how these patients understand their prognosis and trying to figure out how you actually measure that in an empirical setting. We've also surveyed involved oncologists and other cancer investigators. And then we embarked on attempts to produce decision aids. Okay. How am I doing for time? Yeah, about, uh, four or five okay. So this first study, a couple dozen patients. Subsequent to that, we then continued to use pretty much the same survey instrument, studied another 144. Surveyed regarding their motivations and their reasons for trial participation. Surveyed regarding the so-called vital elements, either as in the Code of Federal Regulations or as we would think about them from, from an from a ethics perspective, the vital elements of informed consent. Do you understand the purpose of these trials? Do you understand what your alternatives are to trial participation? What are your expectations of benefit? Do you understand the potential for toxicities? And then we surveyed oncologists. Like I said, there's the data. So the papers are there. Um, the, the significant and impact of this initial work, I think at least in the small world that I live in, is, um, is almost inestimable, inestimable. It was defining work regarding what cancer patients really understand regarding enrollment in clinical trials of experimental agents. These initial papers have been referenced, as near as I can tell, at least 400 times in the subsequent peer-reviewed literature. I don't know whether that's a large number or not, the only person I know who pays attention to how often they're referenced um, is Mark Retain here in our section of hematology oncology. Mark says this is a big number. Um, and it was at the time the vir virtually the only recent study cited as the kind of research needed to understand current issues in research ethics in the, in the ACRE report, right? The Advisory Committee on Human Radiation Experiments report, which at least from my perspective and others is the defining text of the last 12 years with regard to research ethics. Um, and specifically in their conclusions, they talk about research is needed to understand subjects' uh, perspectives in participation. And they reference this study almost in isolation to anything else that was out there, that the first paper, the 95 paper. There's no question that the ACRE report led directly to the NIH's request for applications, their, their call for research in this area on research ethics. There's no question that that RFA le led to the still standing, long standing program announcement called Research on Research Ethics. And it, I know personally, I know that it has spawned at least four R01s. I think we include Rick, at least five R01s at different institutions, not just here, focusing on phase one or including phase one cancer trials. The evidence about the impact of that paper is I know, I can't speak for Rick, so I'll go back to four. I know that that initial 1995 study was the most significant preliminary evidence used for those grant applications. Here, Duke, Hopkins, at Fox Chase. And subsequently, hundreds of articles, I mean, the, I don't, we, we don't even try to track them, and we don't even collect them anymore. Faye doesn't even track them down anymore. There are hundreds of articles in the literature on the ethics of phase one trials. And this has basically become a cottage industry to do phase one trial subject research. So we were obligated then, once we did those in that initial work, to say, well, they don't understand. I, I present this data, others would present, Mark would present this data and say, well, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to make people better, understand better the issues here? So we set out to do that, and that's specifically what George Zimmer was about. George Zimmer, the senior author on this paper published in Annals, 95 or 97, um, George Zimmer was actually a former patient on a phase one trial. 
He was a PhD literature professor, and he wrote this essay that he left behind with his wife and shared with, with uh, the investigators in the Phase I clinic, and it had been floating around between the Ethics Center and the Phase I clinic for a couple of years when I came along. And it was an argument to say, though we submit ourselves to be guinea pigs, we should be allowed to decide what amount of toxicity we're going to be exposed to. Let us choose the doses. It was, I think, a theoretical kind of piece, but Mark said, you know, uh, let's, let's put it out into the literature. Let's put out arguments about whether or not this is an appropriate argument with regard to phase one trials. And so we did that, and then we tried to do it. We tried to allow patients to choose their doses in phase one trials. That got published in 1998. We literally allowed enrolled subjects with terminal cancer to decide when dose escalation would occur and allowed them to choose from predetermined dose escalations. My interest in it, our interest in it was if you did this, if you allowed people to choose their dose, how could they not understand that the, study, the trials were about dose escalation? So we did that. It's never been replicated here or elsewhere, and it was a very difficult study to do. We then went on to other more sophisticated interventions and were involved with Hopkins and Duke, looking at a, a CD-ROM that had spent uh, a couple of years in development and then a randomized control trial with a CD-ROM that was done here at Duke and at Hopkins. There's the data. <laughs> Conclusion from that intervention was that, well, one thing was that over a million bucks got spent in NIH money, combined resources of some pretty good institutions, Hopkins, Duke, and UFC, and the bottom line was it really didn't work, or it certainly didn't work very well. This was state-of-the-art touchscreen technology with surrogate patients talking about their experiences and surrogate physicians talking about their expense experiences with phase one trials. And it was basically a negative study. However, even such a negative study is valuable information as it speaks to how difficult it really may be to change or improve the decision making and inform consent processes in, these, in this setting. So what, hath, what Mark hath wrought otherwise regarding this research? I couldn't get it all. I tried to get it all on one slide and summarize it. It is some of the most influential data related to the study of research ethics of the last 15 years certainly from the perspective of cancer clinical trial research and our research on those with terminal illness, it may be the most influential data of the last 15 years. Here, we have been able, because of Mark's mentorship and stewardship, to develop a very comprehensive program focused on research ethics in cancer care and now advanced cancer patient decision-making defined more broadly. And we're able to, to, to employ a variety of survey and interview methods from multiple disciplines. Been doing it for a long time now. Uh, and over a thousand patients, I think, interviewed, looking at other issues besides just informed consent and looking at interventions, and have begun to study physicians and mailed surveys and interview studies as well. What are we doing now? We have about 350 recordings of these conversations in the phase one clinic and are at work trying to evaluate those. We've begun to work on what role cognitive function plays in these patients' ability to understand. They're heavily pretreated often. Some of them are, are well past the age of 65, and it's a reasonable question to wonder whether or not they even have the capacity to understand some things. And now would like to look at, I think, more fundamental uh, interventions, helping people to understand what their alternatives are to care and what their prognosis understanding is. Most okay, so I'm done. So most importantly, uh, we will continue to bask in the warm and plentiful environment that Mark has created within the McLean Center, and we'll continue to enjoy the freedoms that come from his support, mentorship, and advocacy. And I'll always be grateful uh, for the opportunities Mark has afforded me. And uh, Mark knows I don't like to come down here on the weekend. Um, so, but how much do I owe him? How much is happiness? Well, happiness, uh, happiness means much to me. These are smiles on my, on my family's faces. Uh, my son, whose basketball game I missed today because I had to come down here, told me to make sure that I thanked Mark. You know. So we continue, we all continue to be productive and happy. Thank you very much. Please, Caleb. Well, I think... Uh, Carol, just given the impressive number of collaborations that you undertake with Mark, uh, the question is simply, which paper are you most proud of? <laughs> Ooh. I can hardly wait. Well, I, I really would prefer not to answer that exactly, but I will say that 
the, and, and you'll see why. The paper I'm most proud of is that one Mark has, is one that Mark subsequently says he doesn't any longer agree with. <laughs> so the next time you see me with a glass of wine in my hand, ask the question again, okay? Can we ask Mark the same question? Uh, well, yeah, let's ask him later. <laughs> Bill? So, Chris, I have a question for you. I mean, that's terrific stuff about asking patients in phase one trials what they know about stuff. Do you know of comparable data about any other ability of doctors talking to patients in non-phase one trials where people have demonstrated more understanding than that? There's a follow-up, but that's the first question. Yeah, no, no, yeah, no it's, it's a perfect question. In fact, when I, get, when I feel like people are criticizing phase one research uh, in general and the problems that, it, that it, I always say, well, near as I know, they're the best informed subjects in the literature. Because yeah, that, there was for a long time no other literature. Now there is literature now on randomization and on, on randomized control trials, say in cancer therapy. And there was a definitive study, it actually goes back now even 10 years, trying to improve the process in the randomized control trial setting. Similar kind of thing of lots of an educational psychologist who spent their entire career gearing towards this study and trying to make an intervention that would improve understanding about the randomization process. And it didn't work there either. That's my guess. And yes. so the next question to all three of you and, and um, to the rest of the assembled multitude is, other than sort of the aesthetic warm feeling we get from informing patients in this way, what's the good of doing this? The good of informing patients? Yeah. yeah why bother? You yep. Yeah. Well, I answered your first question, so. <laughs> <laughs> well done. I, th I think it's ritual, and I think, yeah. I think ritual is very important, um, ah. and uh, I think ritual builds trust. Yeah. And, um, you want me to talk about some rituals that aren't so trust building? Uh, no, I don't. I don't want you to do that. Um, but um, I, I think it's an aspirational sort of thing. We're never going to get perfect informed consent, but it doesn't relieve us from the obligation to try to get better. And the purpose of the obligation to try to get better is? It is to more closely approximate um, shared decision making. Even though all the data are that everything we do fails? I don't think that's all the data. Ah, okay, so are there others? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the study we have coming out in academic medicine shows um, that the intervention that we just finished up does uh, improve um, understanding of having a choice about a trial. It's a very narrow context. It's the context of kids diagnosed with leukemia, but all such research is going to be inherently sort of narrow in a particular context. Great. Chris and Carol, are you going to wade in while we figure out who's next? I suppose from a historical perspective, the requirement that we are under to, to, to be forced to focus on these elements, at least in the research setting, comes from the Belmont Report, the Code of Federal Regulations. And you say, well, what did that come from? Well, that came from United States Public Health sort of a syphilis study, and that subjects were not informed appropriately. Um, but if you look at that kind of historical perspective that we're being forced to do this, and is it, a, is, it a, is it a kind of false paradigm to think that it can happen? And the federal regulations say you must inform these nine elements, and it also says you must promote an understanding. Now they were, I mean, the Belmont folks knew what they were doing, and they were certainly sophisticated enough to say, and you must document that they do understand before they can enroll. They didn't say that. They said you must make an attempt to promote their understanding. So there's, there's no predefined threshold at which the, a certain number of subjects must understand all these elements. So uh, you, can, you can look at that and say, well, we then have this obligation to do these things, and we're not required to make sure they understand. But I am challenged by the realities and by the historical perspective which essentially it had to be law to make us do it, to pay attention to these things, which then says, well, if it's, you know, wh why are we doing it? Is it for legal purposes in some respect? Carol, you want to add something to that? Or? I just want to say here, here to what Rick said, and Chris too, but, uh, I think it is aspirational and, uh, and failed at this point. Great. I'm looking to see, Ella, are you somewhere with somebody else? Any other questions or comments? There's one here. <laughs> 
As was mentioned earlier in the day, um, in the conceptualization of, of the Belmont Report and how they think about respect for persons is that there are kind of two parts to it. The first is respect for autonomy, and the second is protection. And it seems that most of the time, we divide research subjects into two categories. There are those who are able to show their autonomy through informed consent and those who require protection. And it sounds like what you're saying is that informed consent is at best always incomplete, it's always imperfect. And I wonder what you think about the role for protection for subjects who we traditionally think of as being able to give consent or to have autonomy. So I, I usually teach this as the three I's, that, that there's investigator integrity, IRB review, and then informed consent. And, and the first two are much more important at protecting people from research risk. But it doesn't mean I would amputate the, the bottom I. And I think on the um, other side, you have to think about the Abigail Alliance case uh, recently, something that this phase one ethics stuff uh, brings up, and, and access to the latest, greatest, newest thing that people clamor for. So, so you know, um, there's a pendulum sense to all of research ethics, too, I think. Great. Any other questions or comments for this panel? I guess I should, because we're talking about these papers, the, the, you know, sure. the Zimmer paper um, argues specifically against that. That is, he, as a terminally ill cancer patient, said, don't condescend to me, don't protect me, I can make my own decisions and I'm capable of, of doing that. And at least in the cancer research world, when there's been talk about that, take the terminally ill cancer patients and lump them with the other truly defined vulnerable populations, to say defined in the federal lump them with those that are, have mental, that are mentally impaired, with children and with prisoners. The, the, from a practical perspective, of course, that couldn't happen. And in this day of patient advocacy, um, it would be, I think, absolutely the wrong thing to do, to make assumptions and say, okay, if you have this kind of illness, then you, you are a vulnerable population. The, no question, though, that the, the potential for vulnerability in the population is enormous, and their potential to be to be enrolled without their full understanding is there. Maybe I could just ask you guys a question, and I see that uh, panelist is uh, wanting to uh, comment too. So we'll hear from you, Mark, on this topic. Um, uh, going back to the reflection yesterday, so this is a panel on empirical research in uh, in, in bioethics. As you think back over the last ten or fifteen years, and it's a version of Caleb's question, um, what finding what empirical paper, if any, um, here or elsewhere, do you think has made, led to a fundamental change in patient care or research practice? Well, I'll answer it by not answering it and by saying what paper in general has, what paper has changed medical care and patient treatment of any kind? I mean, how many have there been? Uh, an intriguing thing to me is when something is found, how ignored it is. I mean, th that's amazing to me. Uh, there are several studies which fellows have been involved in, Michael Green is the one I'm thinking of right now, where respondents know a guideline and don't follow it. And the same thing happens medically. So I think that there, I'm not answering you. No, but it's a very fair comment for calibration. However, there are examples, you know, the NASET trial, uh, around Kent Rod and Eric. I mean, there, there are examples generally, but you're absolutely right. They're very few and far between. And I'm just wondering what our best examples are in the field of ethics. I want to, I cannot believe I'm doing this, but I'm going to argue with you about the uh, support project. And that is, no, a very brief argument. Before it was done, everybody said if there were a controlled trial, we would know. If we uh, informed doctors, it would work. And then when it came out negative, and for 10 gadillion trillion dollars, uh, people now disclaim the study. But I, wanted, I just wanted to say that word in support of the support study. No, I, that's fair enough. And I think the yeah. support story is very two-sided. Yeah. There's a lot of positive things to say about it, including that. And I just raised a little question, so that's totally fair enough. Back to the overall question, though. Do, do you uh, fellas have an idea of, um, I mean, do you have an, a, a NASA, an ethics NASA in your mind, or an ethics, uh, you know, there's other examples. What's a good example of an empirical study in ethics, and I mean quantitative, qualitative, anything that relies on real data that's fundamentally changed uh, patient care or research practice, or maybe even not so fundamentally? I can say where the, where research, uh, research finding would have changed patient care, except that reality intervened. 
and that was in our first ALS page, uh, study. We found out that there's patients, I don't, all, for those of you who don't know the disease, toward the end, you can't talk. I mean, and that's how you sound when you talk. And your caretaker can usually get that mumbling in a way that a stranger can't. And the patients wanted to talk to the doctors alone. But for speed, they had to have the caretaker there so that we recognized that there was a real need. And the, and the neurology clinic tried to introduce private patient time, but it turned out it took too long. Yeah, but Sorry. it's a good example. Uh, do, you, do you fellas have anything you want to well, cite? You know, to the, the challenge in any published data here and change in clinical practice here is being able to show that that's cause and effect. I mean, I, in breast cancer therapy, I think about the randomized controlled trial, trials that showed that lumpectomy was equal to mastectomy. And everybody says, see what it did to physician practices. And yet, it's possible that it had nothing to do with changing physician practices. Pub papers published in the New England Journal of Medicine, the community becomes aware of it, women become aware of it. And it's not that the surgeons read the paper and changed their practice, it's that the women knew the data and they came in and began to demand lumpectomy. It had nothing to do with the effect on physician practices. So I don't know, I mean, it, it, you know, the, I can think of papers that should have changed. Um, the problem in research ethics is that there are federal regulations that put in this bureaucracy that make these requirements that even when we know that there ought to be changes, they make, it becomes very difficult to change the federal law and the 25 years of interpretation of, of that law. This Terry Davis paper that was published in JNCI in 1998, I mean, it's as good as any paper. And those that are interested in interventions on improving informed consent in clinical trials will look at that paper and say, my God, how hard do you have to, you try this hard, you do this much. The CD-ROM that we did, the efforts we spent trying to get patients to choose their own doses, and yet it doesn't seem to affect that. I think it's possible that that in and of itself, those negative studies, change clinical care because we talk, I think we talk about the need, the obligation for informed consent so much more now than we used to. And I think there are clinicians that really do try to do things. It isn't just give them the form and leave the room. They say, I know the form is irrelevant. I know it from my own personal experiences. And now I know that it's in the data that the form doesn't provide help. And so it's all on me or it's on the research nurse to really perform the, the vital obligations that are now. So I can make the arguments that I think you know, it enough. has changed. Rick, you want to pipe in here before we turn to the FES Shrifty? Just again, the, the world of, of childhood cancer, I think things are different because of, of some of the work that w was started here, whereas in, in the old days, kids were just put on studies. Uh, I think the younger generation of pediatric oncologists really does inform consent, and they accept when, when parents say, no thanks, I don't want to be in that, in that study. And the kids are still going to get good care despite their non-participation. Let me just reflect, Mark, that there, I think there are examples of this, and some of them are probably moderate. Maybe we could even identify some that are, that are major. I think the pulse that we heard about this afternoon might be an example of, but um, I just want to reflect collectively in the room, why don't we start thinking this way on the impact end and then uh, and, and work backwards? Because until we calibrate, the, until we sort of catalog those successes and start to argue about impact of the research, it'll always be a bit of a niche push strategy until you've really got those successes to uh, build on. And mark your reflections, and then I know Laura has a comment, but maybe you can make that in your, in your talk as well, because I want to shift. I'll, I'll, I'll be very brief, but um, I, I think the panelists, I thought your question was a great question, and I, I think the three panelists are being too modest in certain respects. With regard to the Zimmer paper, which is one of the papers in, in the book, uh, and the one that, that Chris mentioned, um, the Zimmer paper is an extraordinarily radical paper. And if you talk about changing attitudes in a field, uh, you have to read that paper carefully. It was the reflection, reflections of a dying, anthropology professor, brilliant, obviously. We, I didn't know him. I, I just knew him from his writing, um, about his attitudes towards the dying process and his commitment towards clinical research. What, what Chris and Mark Rutain um, then did with that, with that 
with that document is they developed this really radical understanding of two attitudes, two, soci two different societal attitudes towards clinical research. Uh, one that they regarded as rather cautionary, conservative, and prohibitory, uh, which came to be called the Nuremberg paradigm, that, that researchers always have to be suspect and that the, the patient or the subject uh, is always vulnerable and likely to be taken advantage of. And then the paper contrasted, contrasted that traditional attitude towards clinical research with the attitude that had been emerging in the late 1980s and early 1990s. That paper came out in 95, uh, and they called it the AIDS paradigm. The AIDS paradigm was contrasted with the Nuremberg paradigm. It was a very different social attitude towards medical progress and towards the people who create medical progress, the investigators. It, it was an attitude in which the subjects were not vulnerable, but in fact were co-investigators with the researchers. They were saying that we have potentially lethal diseases, or actually lethal diseases, like uh, advanced cancer or like AIDS, and we insist, we demand, that we be participants with you in trying to overcome or discover solutions to that. It, it is, I believe, a tension that continues to exist in, in the American research community and in the ethics community also as between these two fundamentally different attitudes towards clinical research. And, and, and that paper clearly took sides with one of them. I, I, so I point to that paper. A second paper on, on which Rick re referred to and, and Carol was a part of was, again, an extraordinarily radical paper, the one that Rick was lead author in the New England Journal on bone marrow transplants for sickle cell disease. Uh, that, that paper, I think John Lantos was on it, and where's John? John and... Uh, a bunch of other people. And yeah, other going. people. I mean, th that paper, that, that paper which studied, which studied only 57, only 57 children and their surrogates, turned out that 56 of the 57 surrogates were their mothers, um, in, in the University of Chicago Sickle Cell Clinic, essentially showed something that had never been showed before. And that is that when parents make decisions for children, uh, with respect in this case to pretty terrible disease, sickle cell disease at, in its worst manifestations, they often do so not only based on the child's needs, but also based to a degree on their own needs and values. That is, they're, they're now being the parents' needs and values. A radical reinterpretation of the millions upon millions of decisions that go on in this country every week, every month, in, not only in pediatrics, but in all the adult situations in which surrogates are participating in decision making. Uh, a, a paper whose, whose implications, I think, have never been fully explored or, or discovered, but but those are the kinds of papers that really can change can change fields. My point isn't that they're not there. My point is we're not good at analyzing that and talking about them. So I think the sort of if it's ten seconds, because we're moving on in ten seconds, can you do it in ten seconds?
you know, you're absolutely right, and what a great segue to our next session on teaching ethics. So with that, I'd like to thank this panel. And, uh, Now, just before introducing the next couple of speakers, there's a gentleman here who's uh, trying to escape, and I just want to acknowledge him before he does. Uh, Dr. Pellegrino is obviously, uh, obviously one of the giants of, uh, of medical ethics. And Ed, uh, Ed just wanted to, uh, uh, knowing that you're leaving for three, uh, just wanted to acknowledge on behalf of Mark and everyone here uh, how much we appreciate uh, not only the 25 years of work you all have done together, the both of you together inspired many of us. Uh, you're a giant in the field of medical ethics. I wanted to acknowledge that. I wanted to thank you very much for spending a couple of days here with all of us and um, for so graciously participating in this meeting. Ed's a little too young for a fest shrift, but uh, at some point we'll... Uh... <laughs> the um, uh, next session then is on uh, teaching ethics, and thank you so much for that segue. I'd like to introduce both of the uh, speakers and then ask them to, uh, uh, to, to come and, and give their presentations. Uh, Jordan Cohen is actually a giant of US medical education. He's the president emeritus of the uh, Association of American Medical Colleges, having served uh, for 12 years as the president of that organization. In addition, he's now the chairman of the Alfred P. Gold Foundation, which advances humanism in medicine through innovations in medical education. He also serve, serves on the boards of the Josiah Macy uh, Junior Foundation of New York, the Foundation for Biomedical Research, the Morehouse School of Medicine, National Medical Fellowships, the Cotter Foundation, and, uh, and other groups. He's also a member of the Special Medical Advisory Group of the Department of uh, Veterans Affairs. I'd like also to introduce our second speaker at the same time, and that's uh, Laura Roberts. Um, now, many of you heard uh, John Lantos' introduction of Laura Roberts uh, yesterday. I think the key words there, well, I won't repeat, the, were people here yesterday? Do you remember that? Uh, yeah, so that might be part of the story. Um, I'd like to try an alternative approach to introducing uh, Laura Roberts, and we'll see which one uh, works for you. Uh, Laura is the Charles E. Kubley Professor and Chairman of the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Medicine at the Medical College of Wisconsin, where she's also the Chair of the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Medicine. She founded and serves as Director of the Empirical Ethics Group, which is a multi-site, multidisciplinary research team devoted to exploring clinical ethics issues in medicine. She's received fellowship training and served as the director of the programs at the Center for Clinical Medical Ethics here at the University of Chicago, the McLean Center, and then she joined the faculty at the University of New Mexico before uh, moving to Wisconsin. And um, for those of you who may not be aware, Laura really has gone, included her medical ethics youth roots, but has gone well beyond. She's really one of the true leaders of uh, academic psychiatry in the United States. So uh, with that, um, Jordy, could I ask you to come and give your presentation? And thank you very much for being with us. OK. Well, thank you, Peter. Uh, despite that very generous introduction, I, I really have to start with a caveat. Uh, I have no authentic bona fides for being up here. <clears throat> Uh, if I could paraphrase uh, Lloyd Benson when he had that famous debate with uh, Dan Quayle, I know Mark Siegler, and I am no Mark Siegler. <clears throat> uh, I'm not a clinical ethicist. I'm not an ethicist. I'm not e even sure I'm ethical, but um, <laughs> I really am just uh, enormously honored and privileged to be here to uh, to pay tribute to Mark, who I do know. And I got to know Mark first in 1982, when I took a somewhat bold leap of faith, leaving a very comfortable division chief to, chiefship at Tufts New England Medical Center to uh, uh, come here to take a flyer as the chairman of medicine at the late and lamented Michael Reese Hospital. Uh, at that time, I was 
somewhat related to the University of Chicago. I think there was a fairly ambivalent view about the relationship between the university and Michael Reese at that time. But one of my very early memories was of this teddy bear who walked into my office, announced himself as Mark Siegler. He said he wanted to welcome me to, to Chicago and invited me to participate in one of his sessions where I was interviewing a patient and we were discussing some of the uh, interesting ethical issues that were arising there. So I was enormously grateful for Mark's uh, initial overture of friendship and his continued uh, nurturing of my uh, academic life uh, while I was sequestered over there uh, uh, in Michael Reese. Well, I stayed at Michael Reese until 1988, which is an interesting year because it, it marks the beginning of this lecture series 20 years ago. And I figured that when I left, the ethical climate in Chicago improved to such an extent that it was possible to start this, this series. So, so I want to at least take some credit for the uh, initiation of this series so from that vantage point. Well, seriously, I wanted to uh, say a few words about this very seminal paper uh, that Mark wrote in 1978, 30 years ago. In fact, uh, 30 years ago, Mark said that the design of medical ethics curricula remains in an experimental phase. We're about to tell you that we are still in that phase. He pointed out, though, that there were ethical activities going on in medical education, that there were ethics seminars, courses, lectures, workshops. These issues, as I learned yesterday, were, I think, a reflection of the fact that at that time, clinical ethics was really not a field that was well recognized within the ethical community, that there was the philosophers and the religious thinkers that were dominating the teaching uh, of ethics, and that it was done in a classic academic setting and not in the clinical uh, arena. He also pointed out that ethics grand rounds were, about, were, were being started at that time. Does anybody know where ethics grand rounds began? It was at Stony Brook. Do you know who the dean of Stony Brook was at that time? Ed Pellegrino. I'm really sorry that Ed left when he did, because I'm going to make additional references to him. But Ed was obviously a pioneer in this field, and he did begin Ethics Grand Rounds, that concept, when he was dean at Stony Brook in the, in the early 70s. Well, Mark pointed out that this mode of teaching medical ethics really lacked uh, a certain authenticity, and that the basic rationale and I think also, as I think was pointed out in that article as well, a rebuttal at the same time about teaching clinical ethics at the bedside. And what Mark said was, it is counterproductive to remove ethical considerations from the holistic concerns of the competent clinician. And I think that statement can and was read two ways. One way was that you can't teach ethics in that setting because it's inherent in the way clinical medicine is produced in its, in its legitimate and authentic form, and that it's, it's artificial to think about ethics as somehow being embedded rather than being sort of in, inherent in the, in the uh, clinical activity. On the other hand, it's also fair to say that the arguments for teaching clinical ethics at the bedside in the context of teaching clinical medicine are very powerful, and I think they're virtually axiomatic, and that clearly was Marx's point in this, in this seminal article. First of all, the intensity, the immediacy, what I would say is the poignancy of the bedside encounter just gives that relationship between the learner and the, and the teacher a certain emotional and contextual uh, sense that is simply not possible to duplicate in any other setting. Having the immediacy of that patient issue right before you and involved in the, in the actual issue uh, gives that teachable moment, if you will, an, incor an, an incredible amount of power. Secondly, the patient as teacher, the Oslerian tradition that Mark, actually the title of the article was included a, an allusion to, to Osler as the sort of the, the architect, the archetypical and the inventor, if you will, of the clinical bedside teaching and that this notion of teaching clinical ethics at the bedside was very much a part of that very strong and, and dominant powerful tradition of teaching clinical medicine in the presence of the patient and seeing the patient as really the predominant teacher uh, 
in that, in that setting. So this was another strong argument for teaching uh, clinical medicine at the bedside. And as another argument that uh, Mark noted, that, that when ethicists in the uh, previous uh, iteration tried to impose or suggest or offer ideas about how to teach medical ethics to the physician, it was often seen as an intrusion on the physician's sort of rightful domain. It's the hegemony of the doctor being suggested being invaded by these outside forces that were telling the doctor something that uh, he or she uh, should have known already. So the notion that teaching clinical ethics, having the clinicians teach ethics at the bedside was a counterweight or a, uh, a resistance to this notion that uh, ethics was not something that ought to be included because it was an outside uh, uh, force looking in. Medical ethics will become an integral aspect of professional life when it is taught to medical students at the bedside and when it is no longer artificially divorced from the practice of medicine, a quote uh, from that article. Another strong argument for teaching uh, clinical ethics at the bedside. And finally, modeling the true physician, the complete physician, which is probably the most, I think, compelling argument for uh, teaching clinical ethics at the bedside. And what Mark said then was to, to practice ethical or humanistic medicine effectively, the physician's first and principal obligation is, of course, to become technically competent. Simply being ethical is obviously not sufficient. Technically competent. The ethical issues of caring for the patient should not be arbitrarily divorced from the act of caring for the patient. Again, an echo one I'm sure hears of Francis Weld Peabody's famous uh, aphorism that to care for the patient is to care for the, 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 knowing how to care for the patient is to care for the patient. Well, that uh, gives me an opportunity to take a brief aside and talk a minute about the Arnold P. Gold Foundation that Peter mentioned uh, is one of my current activities as chair of the board. It's interesting that the uh, Arnold, Arnold P. Gold, for some of you who uh, may not know, is, is, is still a pediatric neurologist at Columbia, very, very respected, uh, very effective pediatric neurologist, who exactly 20 years ago, 1988, the uh, same year that this series began, started this foundation because he was so frustrated by what he was seeing as the as the tendency of, physician, of, of students and residents in particular to be so captivated by the technology that was growing up in medicine that they were losing touch with the humanistic aspects, the ethical aspects, if you will. I'm using humanism here very much as a synonym for clinical ethics because I think there's a tremendous amount of overlap in those, two, in those two concepts. And just to back up a square, the ethical issues of caring for the patient should not be arbitrarily divorced from the act of caring for the patient. What, what Arnold Gold was observing was, in fact, that there was being a, a divorce, a forced separation, if you will, uh, not forced on, but was something that was spontaneously seeming to uh, emanate from the over uh, uh, concern of the, the, the power of the technology being so persuasive and seductive that it was taking, at least in his view, the uh, uh, viewpoint away from the uh, uh, um, ethical issues, the, the humanistic issues among such. So he started this foundation that in the past 20 years has, I think, had a very interesting relationship to the McLean Center and its, its activities. It's trying to embed in medical education the attitudes and preserving the attitudes of humanism and humanistic care uh, among young physicians as they are uh, learning their craft and becoming acculturated to, to, to the profession. Many of you may know about the white coat ceremony, which is the signature uh, um, activity of the, of, of, of the Gold Foundation. It does many other things, Pro professorships, small grants, also has formed uh, Gold Humanism Honor Societies and now 72 medical schools across the country where students in their third year select 10 or 15 percent of their peers, peer selection of those students that they think are most emblematic of these humanistic qualities to form not only an honor society, but also a change agent group that is uh, poised to affect cultural change in their institutions to keep these ideas of clinical ethics and humanism alive. Well, with that aside, let me also get back to the paper and Marx pointing out that there were many barriers to teaching clinical medicine at the bedside that he recognized 30 years ago. 
Uh, they were physicians uh, are questionably qualified to teach medical ethics. Do they really have the necessary grounding to carry that uh, curricular activity uh, through to the uh, students at the bedside? Medical students may be ill-prepared to learn medical ethics at the bedside, considering their limited, if any, background in the humanities, or certainly in, in philosophy and in the ethical grounding of the profession. So could they actually gain uh, that uh, knowledge? Many important issues in medical ethics uh, may not be encountered at the bedside. Currently that's clear, and we've heard a lot about them uh, yesterday and today, that there are issues that simply don't arise in that setting that are also critically important for students uh, to know. It didn't seem to me that that's an argument at all against teaching clinical medicine at the bedside, but simply points out that it has uh, some inherent limitations. And finally, and I would say perhaps most importantly, and certainly reference to today, that physicians may be reluctant to formally teach medical ethics at the bedside, even if they may feel themselves competent. And I would argue that each of these four issues, certainly the, the three that are directly related to the, the bedside issues, are very much alive and well today, unfortunately, in fact, more so, particularly the, the last issue here. I think everybody knows that the, the plight of the, of, the, of, the, of the clinician educator, the physician who's trying to be both a clinician and an educator uh, on the wards or even in the ambulatory setting, is so pressed for time, so burdened with the need to be productive in the, in the marketplace of, of academic medicine these days that the amount of time available to devote to the teaching mission is one of the most important, I think, limitations that we're currently, challenges that we're currently facing uh, as educators to try to figure out how to preserve that precious resource, namely the time of the clinician teacher to uh, involve him or herself in this important activity. And clearly, to teach clinical ethics at the bedside in addition to the other uh, agenda items or curricular items that the clinician teacher has to uh, fulfill is a daunting task under today's circumstances. So I think the, the expectation that we're going to find clinicians at the bedside that are actually going to carve out time or find the space uh, in their lives to really fulfill this expectation is, is at least dubious in, in, in my view which is to me, a, 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 on the positive side, an absolutely compelling argument for what the most important way in which clinician educators teach clinical ethics, and that is by role modeling, by simply being ethical and ob observing the ethical norms in their day-to-day -day activities and their day-to-day -day treatment, not only of their patients, but of each other and of the staff and of the students and all around them. The so-called hidden curriculum that we all, I think, have recognized for years as being the most powerful learning device that exists in medical education, perhaps in other forms of education as well, but certainly in medical education, the power of the hidden curriculum, the way in which physician teachers, role models interact uh, in their own lives and their own, with their own patients are the messages that students learn most effectively and carry forward in their own uh, modeling of that behavior uh, in their own lives. So the fact that, that uh, the clinicians have, I think, limited time to fulfill the sort of expectations that Mark was laying out 30 years ago, uh, I think is, a, is, is true, but I think it also underscores the importance critical importance of those individuals remaining themselves uh, the, the valid, authentic role models for, for clinical ethics uh, that they must be if we're going to really sustain uh, this activity and this set of values uh, for the future. Well, Mark uh, quoted Ed Pellegrino, and again, I'm sorry Edison here to uh, recall this, but five years ago, in 1973, in, a, in an article in a book uh, that was public, published by the Hastings Center, uh, Ed said the following, a number of students will need to be trained both in ethics and medicine and in medicine as some are trained now in biochemistry or physiology in medicine. A combined program in medical ethics deserves serious consideration as a source of future teachers in this field. So here it was 30 years ago that Mark was recognizing the wisdom of his teacher, Ed Pellegrino, in what I assume was one of the formative ideas that led to why we are here today, celebrating this last 20 years or more of fellowships and of the enormous, enormous impact that Mark and obviously through all of you have had on this field. And I'm just, just enormously, enormously proud of what Mark has accomplished uh, 
uh, in this regard, and I'm sure he acknowledges his debt to Ed Pellegrino uh, for pointing out the need to really uh, institutionalize this activity in a way that's been so dramatically effective uh, in the McLean Center's uh, uh, activities and its, and its many, many successes. So Mark threw down finally a gauntlet that I want to end my, my brief remarks with, and it's the following. Moral discourse in the context of clinical medicine will not become a legitimate enterprise for medical students and house officers until it is used by their clinical mentors at the bedside, again, the mentoring idea, and until attention to these moral ethical issues can be shown to improve patient care and physician satisfaction an issue that Peter raised yesterday in his remarks and just came out in the discussion we just had in the previous panel. Now, I'm not a student in this area, but I gather from the quarter conversations that I've had that there is precious little evidence, in fact, that there has been a, an effect, a positive effect, on patient care or on physician satisfaction, for that matter, but particularly on patient care, on the outcomes of patient care that can be accounted for, allotted to uh, clinical ethics. And I would sort of now just suggest out of total naivete a, a research agenda that I would wonder whether or not it's worth trying to pursue, recognizing how difficult it may be. But one of the thoughts that has occurred to me during uh, listening to these activities over the past day and a half is that it seems to me that the basic rationale for teaching clinical ethics is the assumption that there's some gap between the optimal nature of clinical decision making from the ethical point of view and what is actually going on. That I think we all must agree that there's something to be gained from teaching clinical ethics because we think that there are decisions being made out there in the real world that fall short in, by some measure of the ideal we'd like to see uh, characterize the profession more generally. Well, is that true? If so, to what degree is that true? Would it not be possible to do a study in which one took a period of time in a, in a particular setting, a hospital setting, a clinic setting, both office setting, whatever, and just look at the decisions that are actually being made by practitioners in the real world? and evaluate them as to whether or not or how close or not they approach what you would regard as an appropriate standard of clinical ethics. And in that way, having some measure of what we're trying to accomplish and some way of calibrating whether or not this ethical, this educational activity over time is producing an effect. Be interesting. I grant that it's probably an impossible study to do, uh, but you have some very bright researchers here who can perhaps figure out how to uh, mount such a study. But I wonder where, whether that would help um, not only ratify the work that you're doing in the teaching of clinical ethics, but would actually give you an opportunity to fulfill this expectation or this gauntlet uh, that Mark threw down 30 years ago. So with that, I thank you again and thank you for your attention. Thanks, and Laura, could I ask you to come and give your uh, paper? Thank you. Well, as we're getting started, um, what Peter didn't want to say is that I was the person who was introduced yesterday as the barefoot pregnant medical school dropout <laughs> 20 years ago. Um, and in fact, I met Mark when I was 21. And uh, it's really a joy for me to be back here. Um, and, and let me express my appreciation to Lainey and to John and to Peter. And also, I also want to um, tip my hat to Dr. Cohen. Um, I was a medical student at Michael Reese in 1986, and Dr. Cohen was there. And when I learned that I was going to be presenting today with Jordan Cohen, it was like you know, co-presenting with God. And so here I am. And I thought, rather than overviewing medical education, I would kind of talk about the unique perspective I have on Mark with respect to leadership and medical education. And um, I think with both Mark and with uh, Dr. Cohen, one of the great formative uh, experiences I had when I was 21 to 25 was that real people, 
real people become great and influential individuals in American medicine and can really do good. But they're real people. They're not somebody else. They're us. And that's one of the core issues in leadership is accepting that we are the ones who are responsible for carrying that forward. But saying all that, and I hope you know I have tremendous admiration for Mark, I will also tell the story of how I avoided him like the plague, my God. I was told, because I was one of these liberal arts kids at University of Chicago, I was told, oh, you've got to meet Mark Siegler. So I was kind of wandering around the halls, and I ran and bumped into Mark, and he learned my name, and he said, oh, I've heard of you. Come, come talk with me. And he brought me into his office, and this waft of cigar smoke came out. Honest to Pete, he was wearing a big purple bow tie. Do you still have it? No, good. Good judgment. He had, <laughs> he had, he had a spittoon. He, I never saw him use it, but he did have it. He had a, um, a thing the size of, like, of a hubcap that was filled with cigar ashes and old cigar butts on his desk. And he says, oh, you must come work with me. And he said, and you could help me with this. And along the whole side of the wall were a bunch of garbage bags, paper garbage bags. And what he would do is he would read the New England Journal, and he would like pitch it into one of those bags against the wall. If it missed, it was OK. It was like near. And so he had do like a dozen of these garbage bags. I'm telling the truth, and you know it. And he was like, come work with me. And I was like, you know, I have good judgment. I am not coming anywhere near you. So. <laughs> So I hid. I hid for a year and a half. And then he was um, sneaky and put me into his small group in physical diagnosis in the medical school. And thus began a great, uh, great partnership. And this person who I avoided like the plague actually really gave me the greatest uh, lessons in leadership and mentorship and in the fulfillment of duty in, in this life. And I'm going to talk just a little bit about that. When we think about teaching, which is really the, the um, source article that we're supposed to be discussing now, I really want to talk first about leadership. You know, Mark is a great leader in education. He's a great leader in research. He's a great leader in ethics, a great leader in medicine. And the reason he is is because people turn to him. They trust him. He is the one who they believe should carry the responsibility for certain kinds of things. His vision, his creativity, his strengths, his, the courage and intellect, the unique combination of courage and intellect, which was a little bit adolescent back in the day, okay, but still was very fair, very thoughtful, fundamental decency, fundamental kindness, generosity that was amazing. And you know, everybody talks about the vision of leaders, you know, what they see, the imagined world, and I honor that. But what is really amazing about great leaders to me is what are the givens? What are the absolutes? What are the things that you cannot continue, what, what cannot happen? If it continues to happen, you cease to be you. You cease to be who you are because you've permitted that to happen around you. So Annette talked about how, you know, Mark didn't write in the literature a great deal about African American issues or about women's issues, but he went ahead and he brought in African American women to help lead and develop the field. For me, I was in a medical school where nobody was pregnant. This was not an accepted behavior. And yet, he brought me into the fold, gave me room to create and develop things. He's almost as good as a feminist. In fact, you might be better than a feminist through action, not through necessarily the words themselves. So the idea is, leaders do what they cannot not do. Leaders do what they cannot not do. And they stand for something so great that other people turn to them. And in this paper, what you see is an elaboration of things like the importance of multidisciplinary thinking. Mark cannot help but think about history as he's living out this moment. He cannot help but think about the intellectual history, the impact across multiple disciplines as he's living out this moment. And that is how he leads. It's through that example. It's through that intellectual commitment. He carries the wisdom of the past. He believes in the human condition as the greatest teacher. He believes in the human condition as the greatest teacher. He believes that by putting medical students at the bedside with people living out illness and disease, showing courage and heroism, as Helen Keller describes here, at the same moment of immense suffering, that that itself will be a great instructor. But not alone. You have to have the intellectual, kind of cultural, 
um, milieu and refinement, the revision of your thinking through the information that's shared through these intellectual backgrounds. So it's the combination of experience and intellectual history. The experience, the theory, and the evidence together. And I, I will tell just one story about how I became a psychiatrist and an ethicist. It was when I was, I had been in school here, I went to work at the orthogenic school. Do people know the orthogenic school? School for Emotionally Disturbed Kids, started by Bruno Bettelheim many years ago. And that school, um, many children with a variety, very, very diverse diseases were placed in this school, which, which is a, basically a longitudinal residential treatment center. But back in the day, in the 1980s, 1970s, children there did not receive diagnoses because it was felt to be stigmatizing. Children there were all treated as um, all potentially healthy children, but who had had misguided parenting. And so, for example, they were um, separated from their parents for a full year, not permitted to have any contact with their parents when they were enrolled in the school. They were not given diagnoses because that was felt to be uh, diminishing of each child. And yet I, kind of naively, at 20-whatever years old, walked in and saw excuse me, that there were children who came and they couldn't put a thing down. They had to put it down like 15, 20 times. They had to walk into a room and count, 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 count. They didn't speak. They went for years without words. And so it was very clear that it wasn't just that they were like fine and like maybe their mom was like mean to them. There was. <laughs> There was something fundamental, biologically different about these children. And so what I became as a psychiatrist and an ethicist, because in that moment I realized that very wonderful people worked there, tried to do good. You know, the issues of Bruno Bettelheim and his psychopathology came out later, but the fundamental issue of other people who worked there, they were attempting to do good through their work, but they lacked a medical model. They lacked a biological understanding of the diseases that were um, driving the experiences of these children. And so in that moment, it was very clear that evidence, the biological phenomenology was incredibly important, and that by failing to recognize it, there was an ethical harm that was being done because children were deprived essentially of an ethical standard of care, an appropriate standard of care by being in the school. Do you see? So in a moment, I became both a psychiatrist and an ethicist, and this is why, along with Mark, I also believe that the care of patients is the greatest instructor of ethics as well as of medicine. So let me tell you some more about his leadership. And it was really through um, leading through example. It's just the point that Dr. Cohen made a few minutes ago. We heard earlier from Dr. Moss about how Mark struggled with the issues. Are, is ethical consultation good? Are committees good? How do we do this? Um, the constant wrestling and relentless struggle with different issues. Fantastic role modeling for all of us in this room. We should not have pat answers for these really hard questions. This relentless questioning was extremely important. Um, you don't have to agree with Mark for him to honor your perspective. Um, this role modeling where he caused people to think hard, come to their own conclusions, revise their conclusions, change their minds later because they knew more was fantastic role modeling, that leading by example. And that was very, very important in terms of um, the educational impact that he's had. I also want to tell you one other story about this leading by example and the education that he did at clinical at the bedside. And I kind of disagree with you, Dr. Cohen, in, with respect to one thing. I think every moment that we're in medical settings, we're teaching, we're providing care, every moment, every interaction is potentially therapeutic and every moment is potentially an educational moment. And you probably agree with that. But the fundamental experience of watching Mark in the clinic was like education in motion. And I want to tell one story. And I don't know if the patient was at the dinner last night, but more than 20 years ago, I followed Mark to clinic because he was frantic doing a million things. And I had to kind of pick up pieces of paper behind him or something. And he introduced me to a, medic to a patient. And he said, he took her hand in his hand. And he said, I want you to tell Laura, she's a medical student, she's becoming a physician, I want you to tell her about the mistake I made in your medicine. So here I am, dumbfounded. And the patient turned to me and she said, you know, Dr. Siegler gave me too much of this one heart pill and it made me feel funny, but I called him right up and he said, don't take any more. <laughs> Which I thought was good. Good judgment again, yes. And, <laughs> and so he, the patient came in and they talked through um, what was the medication? What was the right amount? What was the symptoms that she was experiencing? But can you imagine, I mean, really, can you imagine 
being a medical student and hearing a professor invite his patient to talk about a mistake that they clearly and honestly had worked on together. Whether it was truly a mistake or really a dose adjustment, I really don't know. You were very um, gracious in terms of how you described it, but it was um, very honorable towards your patient, and she got the chance to teach me something which was you know, special for her. But the idea of being self-effaced, being humble, being a person who could make mistakes was really an amazing experience uh, for me as a medical student at that time. Here's a slide, can you see it? it says, and give me good abstract reasoning ability, interpersonal skills, cultural perspective, linguistic comprehension, and high sociodynamic potential. It's a great slide, if you want it, let me know. <laughs> so I include this because, and I, I'm coming close to the end of my remarks, relax, Peter. Um, because, you know, Mark doesn't believe that ethics comes down from your mother's knee, it come down from the Lord. It is something where there's a, an intellectual connection with it, there's a self-observation capacity, there's an interpersonal and emotional intelligence piece to it, if I could use the jargon of the day. But that it is something that is a skill that is to be cultivated, developed, be informed in a rigorous intellectual and heartfelt way. It's not a gift. And <laughs> I always include this because it's just so fabulous. <laughs> Thank God, a panel of experts. I like this one, too, because in truth, he actually does value expert perspectives. But the, the beauty of this slide is it gets right down to this is life or death. And, you know, somebody talking fancy at you is not going to help you in that particular day. And that, I think, really captures some of the issues from our key, is always um, thoughtful about the intellectual history, gathering expertise, but always staying riveted on what is the fundamental question. So Florence Nightingale said it well. I think one's feelings waste themselves in words. They ought all be distilled into actions which bring results. Mark is a man who needs results. He cannot not have results to feel that he is doing good in this world. And if there's one thing of importance to him, he is an individual who through action brings about good. Ideas are wonderful, they inform action, but they are not enough. So let me close with just a couple final comments. You know, life is hard. Life is very hard. People in this room have been through a lot. I've been through a lot. And those who know this say that, um, you know, life dishes up both joys and sorrows. And I think, uh, for me, one of the great treasures is having a mentor of this extraordinary quality. And it leads me to treasure Mark, this perspective of, you know, how life can be quite rigorous. But it also makes me treasure you, because you're here, and you're people that Mark himself treasures. So I encourage you all to think about what it is that you cannot not do what must you do to be who you are? And to think about what that is and what that gift is as you propagate this work further. Thank you. Great, Jordi and uh, Laura, could I ask you guys to come up here? So we've got, uh, sorry, we've got about uh, six or seven minutes to uh, have some questions or comments from Jordan or Laura? Lainey, please. So first, I want to thank both of you for just very, very informative, uh, Dr. Jordan and Laura, for such a heartfelt uh, talk. My question is actually, there seems to be the whole professionalism movement, which has started about within the last decade, has sort of usurped the ethics concepts and yet uses a very different group of people to teach. And so we have, when you read the professionalism literature, in fact, there's a, a whole professionalism uh, journal that just came out of Perspectives in Biology and Medicine. And there are actually two ethicists in that, but that's actually quite rare. And we just did a survey of pediatric <coughs> program directors, and the ethics programs are, in a sense, disjoint and separate. And I thought I'd like to hear you comment on it, because in my mind, ethics I mean, professionalism is just subsumed within and through ethics. Want to start, Jordan? Uh, I was just going to say, I absolutely agree with your, with your observation. I think the professionalism movement really has focused 
a good deal more attention in recent years on, on some of the fundamental values that we're trying to preserve in clinical ethics and professionalism, humanism. I think they're, they're, one can parse those words and, and uh, uh, categorize different elements, but I think they overlap tremendously. And I think that professionalism, uh, the focus on professionalism is an opportunity to really enliven the whole area of clinical ethics. And I agree, I think it's not been, I mean, it's hard enough to teach these issues, as we, as I try to talk about, as Mark pointed out in his paper, the place to teach it is at the bedside. I mean, that's where I think the acculturation, the professionalism, the professional identity of students uh, really is either is reinforced or emerges uh, as uh, as they go through their education and training. And I think we do a dreadful job of. Uh, Modeling the kind of values and behaviors that we that we rhetorically talk of as normative, but which clearly is not normative in our culture because of the way we actually do behave and the way people uh, see the way we behave. So I think we really have to pay much more, much, much more attention to the, the so-called hidden curriculum. I think it's obviously important to have the didactic sessions, to have the seminars, to have the research done, to have all of the scholarly work done uh, that underpins clinical ethics, but until it gets actually embedded into the, into the culture of the institutions that we are dependent upon for teaching and, and, and our students are learning in, uh, we're going to be fighting, I think, a, a, a losing battle. And I, I don't think there's been enough attention paid, first of all, to analyze that hidden curriculum, to really understand what the elements are that, that, are, that are dispositive in terms of forming attitudes and behaviors. And as I said before, we need, to, we need to measure it. We need to find some ways to calibrate what is actually going on and, and reflect that reality, that, that empirical evidence against what we're trying to accomplish and, and then devise ways to improve our, our performance. It's, it's, not a, it's not rocket science. I think we haven't applied sort of the methodologies that I think we understand to be uh, uh, essential for advancing understanding in any field to this very critical area of, of our responsibility. Laura and Jordy, what I'd like to do if it's okay very with briefly. you is collect up a couple of other questions okay. and comments and then okay. have you both respond. Do you have okay. something you Just want to say about Just very quickly. This? I mean, you know, you can get pretty caught up in the... Um, Oh, the complexity of it and the politics and territoriality of it. For me, I think be very. Pra my advice to all of us is be very pragmatic. View ethics as the intellectual discipline that is the platform for all of this work, with uh, you know history, uh, law, with social sciences, with moral philosophy, all informing it, and use that. And I, let's not get into a clash of the titans. Let's just ins assume the intellectual basis of the field as informing professionalism. Great. Can we have a question or comment? I think that's Mary, right? And then, uh, and then uh, John, if it's okay with you, Laura, given the way he introduced you yesterday. And uh, then we'll get you guys to respond, then we'll take our break. Mary, please go ahead. Lainey's question uh, brings up a thought that I, I've been ruminating about a little bit. A lot of us here may have taught, I, I certainly taught <coughs> medical ethics to undergraduates for a lot of years before I moved you know, to a medical hospital setting a long time ago. And all of our conversations, every, everyone here, it seems to me the, the entire discussion is directed from the standpoint of the clinician. And in fact, medical ethics and clinical ethics doesn't only have to do with that perspective. To <laughs> it also to it. has to do with to patients this. whom all of us are at some time in our lives as well. And so I guess when I try to teach clinical ethics, whether in the classroom or at the bedside, um, it seems to me I, I want to retain, I think we all ought to retain that sense that ethics is never from a single person's perspective, that it has to be viewed. And actually, even sometimes, Mark, <laughs> I sometimes think of this when I hear so many discussions of the doctor-patient relationship. And that comes across to me sometimes as kind of an abstraction. Because as a matter of fact, there is not an abstract duo here. There are sometimes, not too often actually, but there are sometimes a single clinician and a single patient in conversation. But both of those individuals are right there and meshed in a bunch of relationships 
that they bring to this. And, and I think there's a danger of our thinking of medical ethics as just this sort of one-way um, function uh, or as a single professions function towards others. And so I, I, I'd like to hear whether you agree with that and if clinical ethics or medical ethics is broader than that single perspective, what would be some ways that we could broaden our discussions of it? And you will hear that along with their response to John's question, who's going now. I'm, I'm just trying to sort out uh, the competing vectors between teaching ethics at the bedside and this Oslerian model that uh, you uh, exemplified in the story of going to clinic and having Mark teach, and all the bad things that we say about the hidden curriculum. Because the hidden curriculum is all the teaching at the bedside that people get that presumably we are trying to counter with our didactic or explicit or non-hidden curriculum in ethics classes. So if you set it up that way, it seems that most of ethics teaching at the bedside is in fact bad that people are getting negative role models in this hidden curriculum that we're trying to oppose. So if that's true, should we do less teaching at the bedside and more didactic? So a couple of comments. One of you guys go first, the other go second, yeah, and I'll wrap it up. Yeah, I'll comment a couple things. I mean, you've provided, Mary, the entire basis of all of the research work that I do, which is to look at the perspectives of people living with HIV, schizophrenia, diabetes, cancer, um, all different, whether they live in rural settings, whether they live in inner city settings, what their experiences are in the context of research and clinical care in trying to integrate that into educational um, settings. We've done some pretty interesting, even a randomized uh, educational trial looking at how introducing patient perspective and family perspectives, what impact that has on the attitudes, beliefs, and intention, behavioral intentions of physicians in training regarding integrating ethics in their work. And so I, w I would just like to say that there are models out there. There are a lot of data that relate to this. There are historical vehicles for including patient perspectives, family perspectives in teaching. I just think you're right. They should have greater primacy throughout all of the work that we do. Um, that do actually you sounds talk like about a response to both comments. Yeah. Do you, well, the, in, do you want to talk about John's? Yeah. yeah. Uh, here. Which is a which is yeah, well, I cut comments about the first uh, uh, set of comments as well. First of all, I think you're absolutely right. I think that to view ethics as, as doctor to patient is is a very myopic and, uh, and distorted view. And I, what brought it, what two things brought uh, were brought to mind by your comments. One is that back to professionalism, the, the the single most important pillar of medical professionalism is the primacy of patient interest. And I think if we think about what we're doing always as being what is in the interest of the patient, which means we have to understand what that interest is, first of all. We have to engage the patient in, a, in a, some sort of a communication so that we can, in fact, evaluate what's in their interest and then be honor-bound dutifully to uh, fulfill our obligation to, to meet that interest as best we can. And you're right about the fact that, that certainly in modern medicine, it's, very, it's less often a dyad than a, a multiad. I don't know if that's a word, but, but there are multiple relationships that, that uh, are important in terms of, of, of delivering proper care and, and, and certainly over a lifetime of, of, of illness for chronic disease patients. And there is, I think, in addition to the sort of the individual providers having their own individual responsibilities. There's something over and above called, I don't know whether this is the proper term, but organizational ethics. There's a certain way of organizational behavior, certain standards of organizational behavior that are not just the sum of the individuals who are in those organizations, but really has to do with policies and ways in which organiza organizations are, are, or, are put together and, and the patient's interests, obviously, uh, in mind, that they're, and they're, that, I think that's an area that hasn't been as well examined uh, as individual uh, physician uh, and other provider uh, education. And if I could comment on John's point, um, you're right. I mean, the, the observation is that much of the of the clinical e ethics teaching is bad because it's going on in this in this bedside. Uh, uh, domain where we are seeking so much of the uh, of, 
of what we'd like to see avoided. But I don't see any way, as long as we're wedded, which I think we, we should be and will continue to be, to the Oslerian model of teaching clinical medicine largely in the patient's, uh, uh, um, in the presence of the escape that classroom, that, that point of, of, uh, of learning, and hence we've had Great. Laura, you want the 15-second closer fire away. Those last words were where we need to improve our clinical ethics teaching. Just very quickly, um, I think this is an issue of leadership also. This should be a given. It should be a given that every interaction is therapeutic and respectful, and that needs to be very widespread. And I think the key to that is to be in touch with people's own personal experiences, their own health, the experiences of their loved ones, because if you've ever been treated as an object in a health system, you will never do it to the next person. So creating educational situations where there's some recognition that creates greater empathy for the patient experience, I think, is a really a, a critical method for getting there. So let's thank this wonderful panel.